Hey everybody. In this video I'm going to talk about uniformly best critical regions and do an example using the binomial distribution. So up till now we've only been able to talk about best critical regions for cases where we had a simple alternative hypothesis um, that mu was equal to mu sub a for some value, specific value mu sub a. But in practice, we frequently run into what we call composite alternative hypotheses that are based on an inequality of some sort. So can we still talk about best critical regions in that case? Um, the answer is yes. We'll call it a uniformly best critical region in the situation where we have one. And it's defined to just be a set that is a best critical region for every parameter value that's included in the alternative hypothesis. So, for example, if we have the alternative hypothesis mu less than mu naught, then the region C would have to be a best critical region for every single value less than mu naught, every single value of mu. How do we go about finding such a thing? Well, once again, we're going to use the Neiman-Pearson lemma. It's really the only tool that we have for this, for computing these. Let's do an example, and I think all of this will get a little clearer. This is a pretty typical case where we have a binomial um, question. We have a null hypothesis, B, P equals P naught, and an alternative hypothesis, P less than P naught. Um, we're going to go out, we're going to collect a sample of size n, and we're going to reject the null hypothesis if the number of success we get, successes that we get is too low. So let's jump in with our Neiman-Pearson lemma. Let's compute some likelihood functions. Here, the numerator is going to be the likelihood function at p0, and the denominator is going to be the likelihood function at p1, where we recognize p1 is ranging over all the values less than p0. p is fixed, p1 isn't. Okay, so that likelihood function, of course, is just a probability function where we're viewing it as a function of the parameter, in this case p. Um, so the probability of getting a certain number x of successes in um, n trials with probability of success p0 or p1 is evaluated using the binomial PMF. So that's what we're seeing on the right. It's just a binomial PMF. Right away, there's some simplification. The n choose x is going to cancel in the numerator and denominator. Um, then I'm going to write everything with positive exponents and collect the things with powers of x and powers of n separately. Why am I choosing to do this? Well, let's not forget the whole point, what we're trying to accomplish here. We want to set this less than or equal to k, and then glean some information about x, or equivalently p hat, either the number of successes in n trials or the proportion of successes in n trials. Of course, those are completely equivalent concepts. So what I'm going to want to do is to try and solve this for x. So um, I am going to take natural logs of both sides and then apply some natural log rules and then try and get the x all alone. So subtracting off n ln 1 minus p0 over 1 minus p1 and dividing by the natural log that x is being multiplied by. Great. So it's important to notice here um, and be careful to, uh, to check that the inside of that natural log is greater than 1. p1 is going to be less than p0. And therefore, the natural log is going to be positive. And so when I divide by it, I don't have to switch the sense of the inequality. The last thing I want to do before I start trying to draw conclusions is to divide both sides by n. I'm choosing to do that because I would like to have this inequality with a p hat on the left hand side, the sample proportion, rather than a raw number of successes. So I get this. Um, the right hand side depends on the sample size n and the null hypothesis p0. Those are obviously unchanging. p1 is supposed to be ranging over um, a huge set from negative infinity up to p0. And of course k we don't know anything about. So on the face of it, this right-hand side seems to depend on a lot of unknowns. However, 
The value on the right has to be selected so that the size of our critical region is alpha. We're talking about critical regions of size alpha, and so that's just a requirement. So really, this right-hand side, C, um, is not going to depend on, in particular, P1. K will. So as um, the sample, as P1 changes, K is where the change will occur. But the, overall, the right-hand side is going to stay exactly the same. Um, this value of C is going to work for any simple alternative hypothesis, um, P equals P1, as long as P1 is less than P0. Um, and therefore, this set, P hat less than or equal to C, is a uniformly best critical region for the alternative hypothesis, P less than P0.